Hi, everyone. I'm Tish Conlon for another episode of Tish Talk. Today, we have an amazing gentleman uh, who I've introduced twice, Matthew Errett. Everyone's getting to know him and love his uh, his incredible deep knowledge of history, Canadian history, international history. And today, we're going to tackle ancient history. I wanted to say before we dive in that if you haven't listened to our previous two podcasts, it's very generous of Matthew to give his time. We dived into a little bit of uh, World Wars One and Two and some of the players, good and bad, on both sides and the influences. Um, then we talked about Canadian history, real Canadian history. And I must say, because I just finished his book, The Forgotten Struggle for Progress, I absolutely loved it. And I'm going to get his next books. I learned a lot about uh, the nation builders uh, like W.A.C. Bennett and C.D. Howe and Diefenbaker, uh, the premiers and uh, Quebec influences like Daniel Johnson and Maurice Duplessis, um, and really some of these really strong empirical forces that have hijacked our progress as Canadians. And that's why I'm so determined to get into a political role, however long it takes um, to sort of get back to nation building, because we have this incredible country. So you got me really excited about building the North and all the stuff we can do in Canada, Matthew. So welcome. Um, you're the Canadian patriot, right? I didn't I didn't pull out your bio again. What's your site if people want to follow your yeah, work? Yeah, that's right. And I'm, I'm so happy that you're you're really diving into the, the research and, and really resonating with it. Um, no, it, it's, it's great. It, it makes me happy. Uh, well, yeah, my my uh, my website is CanadianPatriot.org and uh, Rising Tide Foundation .net, which I uh, I manage with my wife uh, Cynthia, who's another excellent writer at uh, Strategic Culture Foundation, which we uh, is a, a good uh, information website. Uh, based we'll have on to the... get her on the show too. Yeah, <laughs> you get your awesome. both. Yeah, happy to join. She just pr produced her her first book on the oh. uh, the empire in which the black sun never set on the origins of fascism in the 20th century. Excellent. Um, wow, yeah, so you guys are a dynamic duo. I mean, right. we'll yeah. Awesome. Well, today we're going to dive into ancient history. And that's yeah. like for you, this is a, and we only have a power hour. So uh, we'll try to get as much in as possible. I have a whole bunch of questions. I don't know how many we'll, we'll get through, but I've kept asking you in these last few sessions about these uh, bloodline families, these ancient families that have really seemingly uh, con controlled a lot of what happens here and repressed knowledge, um, you know, kind of fabricated lies and controlled systems. Um, and this whole great awakening we're going through is we're learning so much about the lies and how deep they go. Um, so let's go back in time at, to what you, wherever you think would be relevant to kind of give people an overview of some of these, um, some of the, the, the ancient foundational pieces uh, in the world, like different, you know, different or civilizations and, and connect them to the family. So, I mean, if you can, and, you know, people have a lot of questions. I've had so many questions about Plato. I think we'll have to save that for another time. Philosophy is a whole new discussion and I'm reading that now, but, you know, Atlantis and all of these things. So over to you, <laughs> dive in. <laughs> Yeah, that that's that's a wide terrain, ain't it? To <laughs> yeah, very wide. Um, well, I, I guess the 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 theme I see in your question is understanding oligarchical systems, um, and obviously people who have picked up on the the existence, the fact of conspiracies shaping our history as a causal agency have come to recognize that there does seem to be uh, the importance of families, certain bloodlines which um, are expected to maintain a certain preeminence within a hierarchical structure of civilizational arrangements, whereby the, ma the majority of families who are not sort of on the inside of this, uh, this club are, uh, are, are expected to be slave families of different you know, strata. And um, the, the, upper, the upper level families on sort of what you could say is the more of the inside have um, a certain role that they're expected to play, their, their children with every generation. And this is a very challenging thing, both to think about, but also to actually do, um, because to maintain this requires a degree of, it's not just maintaining secrecy over generations. That's, that's challenging, but really the difficulty is how do you create institutions that will um, 
they can nothing can ever guarantee a result 100%. But how can you create institutions? And I'm, I'm saying now for an oligarchical grand strategist that will maintain the unnatural ways of thinking and passions that have to be cultivated in the hearts of the next generation of young oligarchs and managers who are expected to carry out the family business. Mm -hmm. That's not easy to do because they're going to be expected as they mature from, you know, childhood to adulthood and, and become parts of a machine. They're going to be expected to do things that the natural human sentiments find repulsive and mm -hmm. irrational. Right. That's very hard to do, but it's done. It, it is, it is, it's been thought about, it's been acted upon, right. it's been perfected. And so, you know, there's that component of it. One of the me mechanisms of this, of the success, you could say, of this system is the institution of a sacredness of a property, which is very unique to the Western matrix in that sense. When you compare it to like Indian, Chinese, a lot of other African historical cultural matrices, the, the, the emphasis and sacredness upon property rights is nowhere as um, deep as we find it in the Western matrix. Now, everybody should have a right to own things. I'm not trying to say that. But one of the things about the oligarchy is that they maintain as a mechanism their continuity over generations through the ownership of trusts and property. Mm -hmm. So what we have is that in looking at some of these families, the Fugger family, or there's, there's families that come and go. Some of them are, are a little bit longer. Some of them emerged in the, you know, ninth century. Some of them emerged earlier. Um, some of them can- The Italian families like the Medicis and all of those as well. Would they yeah, there, there's a variety. I mean, I'm, I'm going to avoid going through names right now of particular yes, families. I, I've written, yeah, that, that's going to be a big chunk of my book, volume four of The Clash of the Two Americas on the Anglo-Venetian roots of the deep state. That's going to be coming out in January as, the, as a fourth volume. Oh, um, oh excellent. Yeah, to pick you know, that up. Got some Merovingians and, and others. But yeah. I mean, yeah, they're, 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 the, the key thing is that they, they are kind of in some ways um, slaves or prisoners to their system, to the, mm -hmm. the, the, the family Fondi. The Fondi right. is, are, are a grouping of funds that have been that have grown out of rents and other things and, and stealing over generations and are managed. There does seem to be a certain managerial structure that mm -hmm. manages uh, right. the dispensation of those funds, but also, you know, there's a certain population control policy within even the oligarchy within, you know, cause you can't ultimately allow a certain family to overgrow and have too much opportunity for conflict within the family and within the, within and amongst the families. Let's, so you have a certain amount of arrangements there about limiting your own children, which is where you have the cultivation of certain homosexual um, tendencies as well to try to just balance out the, yeah. uh, the, 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 the governing class. Can we go back to a few people wanted to know there's um, and then I, I definitely wanted to talk about Kazarians because that's something you could educate us as, as is how that happened. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we, since you brought up these families, we don't need to go through their names, but there's this occult, uh, real strong occult influence with them. And having just read the book, I don't know if you read it, Return of the Gods by Jonathan Kahn. No. I found it, uh, I really recommend it. He, it, it's, it's fascinating and he goes through and it's fairly recent how, you know, a lot of these families worship either pagan gods or they, they were, you know, fighting against God, our creator, and they developed like Baal and Moloch. And, and part of their re rebellion was, um, you know, pushing immorality, you know, orgy, sexuality, uh, murder, anything goes. Um, and they really, they really worshiped and studied the occult. Mm. Um, and I don't know if, it, you know, it's just interesting. I'm just about to tackle Jim Mars, our occulted history. Uh, with the global elite, but um, certainly um, there's this this uh, this battle they have against uh, morality and and God, particularly Christianity and everything else within these families, um, which has really gone on for you know thousands of years in our is as much as we can we can track history. Yeah, well, yeah, and <clears throat> I, I just googled the book. I'm going to buy it. It looks interesting. Um, 
the the return of the gods oh you know, yeah, yeah 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 just uh i have it here on uh online so the the way i would i would say um is important at least for me when i was a approaching my study of this is to come to the recognize recognition as, as soon as you can that between blood the material domain and the spiritual domain the, do, the domain being the of, of the spirit and ideas being metaphysical right so there's the physical and then the metaphysical and they dance together yes so, that's what i'm doing that's where i am focused now and it's fascinating you can't you can't exist and you can't read pure, purely on the physical level because you don't get everything yeah. And that's why you can study physics as well. And um, all of these other uh, things bring everything together, don't they? Philosophy and, and everything else, spirituality. Oh, my, yes. Um, and that, that's why it's important to have a sense of hierarchy. There, there's a hierarchy in nature and there's a hierarchy in ideas. And, you know, for those who don't recognize what I mean, I mean, you see evidence of, um, you know, queen bee right there's queen bee there's there's a certain like hierarchy in the beehive there's there's um within even physics you have a certain idea of like well one dimensionality cannot measure properly two dimensionality two dimensionally has breadth and width whereas mm -hmm. one dimensionality is just width versus like three dimensionality it, volume cannot be measured by simply area it's it's incommensurable it doesn't mean that one dimensions two dimensions are bad it just means that they have a place within a, a system of a hierarchy where you can you can't measure the higher from the 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 standards of the lower mm -hmm. same thing for like animals you know it's like we have an animal side that is common on a variety of levels to wolves and, and chimpanzees but the behavior the rules of behavior that animate the the potentials of a wolf or a chimpanzee species is not what limits us we have the fight or flight mechanism. We have the other like need for food, the need for comforts, the need for stability, just like animals. But we have the additional factor that they don't have access to. It doesn't make them bad, but it mm -hmm. means that human beings have a certain hierarchical position within a system of living processes. So all that to say, because I know some people get a little freaked out when you use the word hierarchy in nature and they're like, ah, oh, you're a tyrant. I'm just, <laughs> so I'm just, yeah. Um, now the oligarchy definitely has an importance on property physical property and bloodlines physical blood as being more better blood than the the slave family blood that's been something that we can find um as a, po a point of high importance going back a very long time into ancient uh, history but what's more important as far as the oligarchy's um causal nexus what shapes it is the domain of culture and ideas. Because you'll find that some of the dominant families today emerged out of like, there were, there were good sociopaths who were kind of newer blood. Some families come, some families go. Some families are like, they have their ascendancy and, their, and they get backstabbed at a time of weakness. And all of a sudden you stop seeing evidence of their having continued on beyond a certain point. Like, and, for example, Constantinople. There were some good people in Constantinople, but when Constantinople was destroyed in 1451 by the uh, the Ottoman, um, you know, it actually wasn't even Ottoman. I mean, it was it was other things too. 1401, 50 years earlier, was where you had the Fourth Crusade, which was a crusade that involved Christians being deployed to kill Christians from like Western Christians destroying Constantinople on behalf of Venice, which is why Venice today has all of these Byzantine uh, artifacts all over the place. So oh, they really? Stole, yeah, yeah. They, stole, they, they used a bunch of idiot mercenary soldiers to go on a crusade in the Holy Land. They never made it to the Holy Land. They were instead deployed to just destroy another Christian city, which oh. is where Venice then became the dominant, the dominant city of the or the dominant center of, of global global power. Now, some of those families that were that were hegemonic in in the Byzantine Empire, they didn't do well. They were wiped out. Um. So you'll find that. So what I'm saying here is that the importance when thinking about an evaluation of oligarchy is to recognize that what is primary is always the ideas, the idea content, which is the same. And what you pointed out by uh, um, this fellow's book, Rabbi uh, Jonathan Kahn, um, it seems as though he's tapping into this, I, I think, it, from what you've said and what I've read um, just now, the they the, the idea of immortality that that they're that the 
that the gods are like cubes, whereas we are like just uh, flat surfaces. The flat, the 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 the, the area, the the, the two dimensional surface cannot measure up it to the cube, it is the three dimensional cube. It is incommensurable. It is incongruent. It is beyond anything we could possibly see ourselves as measuring up to. So the oligarchy wants to maintain this in, this intellectual infinite wall of division between them as immortal gods. And I think that when you start digging behind the stories of the geopolitics of Egyptian pharaohs and the priesthoods managing the stories that would shape the thinking and the imagination of the majority of the Egyptians for most of Egyptian history, maybe not all of it, but much of it, um, you'll find that same thing for the characters like Zeus or like in, in Greece. Mm -hmm. And and his his pantheon of Olympian deities, you'll right. probably find that these were really just oligarchical stories that were created to give the image that 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 higher class is beyond you forever, slave. Right. Right. There's there's this perception, and I mean, you've been at this a lot longer. And then just as you go down all these rabbit holes now, and you know, you have to keep your mind open. Is that true? Is that you know? Is that you could go in so many directions? But the perception is out there that these families stretching back for I don't know thousands of years are actually kind of worshiping Satan. So this this occult influence that they have the secret knowledge of uh, either hidden technologies like levitation or, you know, through now we know the, you know, in Antarctica, like all of these mysteries with the mysterious ice wall, they knew they know a lot that they're hiding from the rest of, of humanity, like even potentially uh, contact with alien civilizations and, and all these other things. But the underlining theme in all of these families is that they've all turned away from God. And it's this like worship of lower frequencies, lower energy being Satan and mass destruction. Like there's this disrespect for human life. And it, that book does talk about how this influenced pagan worship as well. Can you speak to like the, the um, historical, um, any sort of historical facts around these large families ac having access not only to um, um, you know, satanic practices, but also to hidden knowledge. Maybe the hidden knowledge piece might be something you've researched. Um, and if that's even true from your perspective, like, you know, like did Atlantis really exist? I know Plato referred to it, but maybe from a mythological point of view. So different things like that. People are really interested in what drives these uh, families. And we see that right now, right in our face uh, with this ramping up of their agenda, how incredibly destructive it is, how they lie, like they say, every child matters, you know, they pervert things while they're forcing our young children into experimental treatments and all the way they use language, but it's very destructive and it's got that depopulation, anti-human, you know, dehumanizing um, effect, which is, you know, really dystopic. Yeah. Well, I, I think that, um, one has to, when approaching the matter of human systems, the way we're describing them, from the recognition of the existence of conspiracies, one has to use a lot of self-discipline and rigor that we're not yeah. used to because yes. our society is wired in order specifically to make people's minds sloppy with mm -hmm. their it, we, we, we're, we're taught, we're taught, take this as an irony, we're taught to not know how to use our mental tools. Ah, oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. And I'm, I'm learning to have a more disciplined mind because you can just jump into anything almost, right? We've been trained. Oh, that's true. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, it, it could appeal to a variety of presumptions, prejudices, unexamined assumptions, whatever. And yeah, and yeah. So, um, Always be aware, take stock always of what you know and don't know and things you that, that may be true or likely true, but you haven't proven yet to yourself are true so that you don't treat those, those things as if they had the same value as the opinions that you've worked on, you've, you've mm -hmm. constructed um, right. a discovery process in your mind, yeah. yet that has different value and you can build on those. 
So whenever going into a voyage of discovery, you're always wanting to refer back to real knowledge you have in some, and, and it's all related, right? So you could always find a way to relate it back to true knowledge, not what some expert says or what some conventional wisdom says uh, that is popular, whatever um, uh, right. among my, my clique of people or friends. You, you always want to be able to self-reflect, right? Have that, that self-examining process and see also how the emotions grow or stagnate according to different sets of ideas that are, and ideas about ideas, right? Because it's, it's not about the ideas and the ideas just the, the, la, the, the it's kind of like an opinion, right? I have an idea of my backyard. I have an idea of uh, Jupiter, but it's like, that's not, that's not the thing. It's an, it's, it's, it's a, it's a product of my imagination that's tied to certain things. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's not the thing itself. Right. And, uh, and what's important is, is the idea of ideas is the idea of how ideas naturally or unnaturally come into being or create false uh, chimeras. Plato right. and his dialogues is very important. I would say anybody should read, I would say before even looking into an exploration of ancient civilizations or conspiracies, spend, I, I'm talking to the audience here, um, spend a few weeks, I would say, reading Plato's dialogues to mm. strengthen the mental muscle and instincts for navigating in the unknown. Yes. And I have, after I, I watched one of your last podcasts on, it was okay. very technical about physics, but I plotted through and paid Plato's Republic and this one, Plato T Timaeus. You see, okay. Braille, spoke highly. I don't want to go down that now. because No, no, we, we don't have to, but all that to say, don't start with those two. <laughs> <laughs> You have no idea. How many no, it's good that you own them. Mind. They're vitally important, but they're much more advanced. Okay. Start with, the, start with the last, the trial and death of Socrates, four small dialogues. Okay. Especially the apology, the cre the, the apology, the credo, and the and the the Phaedo dialogue on the immortality of the soul. Then, when you have these, are small things you could get them in an afternoon. Take okay. notes. Then move on to the Mino. Move on to Gorgias on living a just life. Okay. Right. And then when you have that, then you can go if you want into the the Republic, which is a, a, a lot of thought experiments. It's a it's an exercise. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and the Timaeus, I would say before you go the, to before you read the Timaeus, read the Theatetus dialogue. Jeez. Oh, boy. I'll be busy. OK, I'll send you a list. I'll, I'll put out a reading. List. OK, maybe, thank maybe you. Included on but, the, the, but so, yeah. So, okay, as a layman, so back to the question. Wait, wait, I wanted to frame okay. it. I've got my frame here now for the audience because a lot of okay. us, like we don't have nearly your level of historical knowledge, but you, you know, what's happened in the last few years has been accelerated, this questioning. Um, and what we see, and I look now at the destruction that I didn't notice, destruction of sovereign countries. And these forces, it's not just been 50 years, it's been hundreds, you know, possibly thousands, is we see these families, whatever it's bloodline, whatever, you know, whether they, there's an occult uh, aspect or not, but they're these forces of destruction against humanity. Well, yep. you know, and, and how do we break free of that? And is this a time where we're breaking free, but learning the lessons from them? Like, it's a big question to me that, you know, these, the evil forces um, at work, um, very, very dark. So yeah, give us, give us some sort of grounding on some of these ancient civilizations okay. with tying to the families that have led us to where we are today, which I think is the tipping point for humanity. The, the first thing I would say, yes, there, there is, and this touches up at what we were saying at the beginning regarding, um, the, the difficulty in maintaining a continu a continuity of something so unnatural. Um, part of that has involved the creation of habits, rituals, and traditions, which involve awakening perverse perversity right. and calling it natural for the governing class. One yeah. of the things that played, and this is, this we does become that, yeah. very quickly, right? Yeah. And it, before, before the Christian era, it had different terms, but ultimately the same effect was the outcome and the desire and the same techniques of corrupting the youth, making, you know, grooming them to become the leaders of tomorrow <laughs> was something that the Babylonian priests were thinking about as well as the, the Roman Imperium. You know, it was, it was something that was a technique that's been refined, but always yes. the same thing. In, in, in its formula. Evil. 
proving evil or I mean, you have to you have to get people to come to the conclusion and make it feel like it's their own that the universe is created by an evil god who made you in its image Mm -hmm. um that will then justify maintaining a hierarchy of of false narratives repression control for uh different levels of the hierarchy so your your upper level managers cannot think on the same level as the controllers of those managers right their own meaning their own sense of desires that are almost religious like that will keep them in check and make their behavior relatively predictable so they won't tend to find sympathy for the lower order um folks who they're expected to manage the lower and order often folks. kill often and often hunt and kill. now sometimes you get you get somebody, it, it doesn't always work. And sometimes you'll find examples throughout history of an outlier who breaks. Look at Mad King George, King George III. They called him Mad King George for a reason. He went he went nuts <laughs> because he he accessed his humanity. He could he was expected to behave. Really? Yeah. He he was uh, close friends with uh, Benjamin Franklin's friend uh, Benjamin West, the royal uh, an, an American from Pennsylvania who was one of the best painters of the world, a friend of Ben Franklin who was installed in 1772 to become the president of the British Society of Fine Arts. Patri and, and King George was the same age as this guy. He, he absolutely loved him in, as far as like just having like a, a real spiritual friend. And, and this guy was like a court painter. He worked hard to try to organize King George around philosophy. George, you know, they, they, would, they would stay till like, you know, 2 a.m. talking about philosophy and and, and George was kind of sympathetic to the rights, the demands of the American uh, colonists to have more liberty and freedom. He wasn't happy about it, but he was, he was a human and that broke him. Um, and they, they had to put him away into an, into an asylum for the last 10 years of his life, right? Um, so there's, there, there's cases like that. I've got cases in Canada too, of certain individuals. that, like that who? Uh, governor Frederick Seymour, um, the, the governor of, of British Columbia when it was still a British colony, um, who was protecting the Republican movement. He was a, you know, a multi-generational British imperialist from a British imperial clan. And he was installed to manage one of the, you know, British Columbia had a certain strate strategic value. And, um, and he ended up becoming organized behind the a Republican ideal and was fighting against Johnny McDonald and, uh, and other uh, pro-British confederationists who wanted to absorb British British Columbia into the empire and and uh, keep it under the control of the anti uh, Republicans, and they had to they had to end up killing um, Frederick Seymour, um, which I, I go through in volume two of the Untold History of Canada um, as well. So there, there's examples of that uh, where people break from their their um, expect what's expected of them because it's hard to make human beings think they're not human it's difficult um, yes do you think that we're um destined to keep repeating the cycle or are we at a point in our human evolution where we can actually break free of this kind of dark repressive um uh, forces and actually kind of as they say ascend but actually move into these um you know really truly caring about humanity like a lot of people say there's absolutely no reason why people should be starving in our world none of that that's all man mind all, everything is man. all of this destruction and death man-made and you know not not something god would want for us is it um is it something we can learn from through from the history that you've seen do you feel optimistic for the future yes no i i do um now i'm not going to answer the question on a more tactical um standpoint in terms of the immediacy of the the yeah. storm we're currently moving through because i don't have an answer for the 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 short Me term yeah. yeah all we so can let's... do is is act as instruments of god's will and obey by obey our conscience and know that if calamity should befall humanity it was not because of us our our yeah. acts of commission or omission but at the same measure too i do think that i believe firmly that humanity is destined for something much more beautiful and we will have a proper rebirth as a mature species Me made too. in the image of God 
um, at some point, hopefully that point will be in our lifetime. Me too. I really hope <laughs> that because I really, I feel it will be, I feel we'll see yeah. it. You're younger than me. So you, pre- yeah, but yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm, we're- fit. I'm fit. I'm, I plan to hang around for many, many years. <laughs> so I got lots to do and I'm, you know, I want to be a nation builder down the road. So let's go back and I'm jumping around because uh, I, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear about the Gazarians. So like just let's go back to a story of a group of, um, that's really impacted people. And then I, I'd love to ask you about China as well. A lot of people are confused about China, ancient, you know, so a little bit of the history and how, and, and some of the forces that shaped that empire. And that would probably be enough for today to get, get us to get us yeah, to the next one. Area China, historical forces. Uh, yeah. Don't you think that's good? Bang. What, what do you, what do you know of Kazaria right now? Like how, how are you thinking about it? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, new to read like to be honest history has never been my strength i mean i'm like oh i've read the the you know skim through history because i'm all about action but i realized how important it is and how we've been lied to about history so probably in the last two years i've dived into some of these influences and forces that have shaped history and the kazarians um how they you know kind of like have 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 been a dark force in history so if you could really give us the short synopsis of how they came to be that you know that was like they were not true uh they were they were trying to uh like have the silk road and be like the the bad guys along looting and pillaging um along the silk road so give us a little bit of background a lot of people are confused about them and then china and and the silk road there Okay. All right. So I, I've done a series of lectures on Kazaria and I've written, it's a chapter in, in volume okay. three of Clash of the Two Americas uh, okay. on a Eurasian Manifest Destiny. Okay. Good. People I cannot can go there do too. justice to yeah. this topic, but I'm going to say it quickly. Um, in the most summary fashion, how would I say this? Kazaria has become a, a hate, a, a scarecrow. Mm-hmm. It, Maybe. Mm-hmm. So the oligarchy creates narratives Mm -hmm. and those narratives, stories, we're a storytelling species, right? We shape our identities around stories. Animals don't do that. So the stories are either um, going to be in harmony with reality or out of harmony. Sometimes they'll be closely in harmony, but they'll be designed to only approximate it on various points, but only to infuse um, a, 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 a lie Mm-hmm. under our radar and a lot of the conspiracy um um minefield it's a minefield right there's different mm-hmm. narrative myths that that profess to explain not just the conspiracies of our age but all conspiracies going back for a long time and to make it internally coherent there there's a variety of different flavors that have been created some of them have more and some of them less degrees of connection to reality as it is discoverable if we if we do the work the Kazarian one is, I think, one of the uh, longer standing ones. Originally, um, I think David Icke was the first to sort of put it forth in the conspiratorial term. Before that, Arthur Kistler was a, um, an, a CIA MI6 operative who first put forth the 13th uh, tribe, um, going through the thesis of Kazaria being the Jewish tribe that um, was sort of the 13th tribe of David, blah, 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 uh, Turkic kingdom of the 750 period that that um uh, you know became jewish i um, read they converted uh because they weren't allowed to lend money previously like they weren't of the jewish faith is that is that a falsehood i just read that recently I've, there's in book. no i've read that that statement i've read a lot of different people writing about it and i gotta say i've never seen any hard evidence backing up that and part of the difficulty with the hard evidence of kazaria has been that there is very little hard evidence that exists of kazaria there's there's right. so a few documents know. from the genitsa the genitsa scrolls that were discovered there are a thousand year old scrolls that were discovered in like an attic of an old um rabbinical uh, house um mm-hmm. that that really just get at like receipts little letters between right. people that infer the existence of kazaria but it's been really wiped out um okay so whenever people yeah. start speculating about too much detail about what exist what it is that the kazarians wanted why did the turks uh uh yeah. vert- it's-, it's sitting on a lot of hot air um at the end of the okay. day 
Well, I read that they um, they were dominating the Silk Road. They were like the you know they were like um, bad guys who were just wanted to dominate yeah. trade, and yeah. then they didn't want to carry all of the the goods with them all the time. Okay. And so they wanted to have uh, money, and they were actually involved in the creation of money. So they they weren't Jewish, but they all because of the the Jewish rules, they could lend money. They converted. So they they all converted so that they could drop all their wares and just uh, loan money to people. Now that's uh, the one there, thing I read. That yeah, is, yeah. I read uh, that too. I read it. Look, the they could have converted to a variety of things. There was paganism that was still pretty dominant back then too. They could have like converted to a variety of other things that didn't have to be Judaism. There's no evidence that it was because they wanted to lend money, but there is evidence that it was a key play, uh, zone among the, what's called the Steps Silk Road. So the Silk Road yes. had a, a southern and a northern extension from east mm -hmm. to west, right. which was revived by the Tang Dynasty that had emerged in 16, 618 out of about 400 years of Dark Age of China. When 618? 618 was when the okay. Tang Dynasty established itself, and by 680 or so is when they revived the foreign policy of the Silk Road. Mm -hmm. as a for the first time in, in you know it had, it had disappeared when the Han dynasty had collapsed in around 200 AD so that was revived and with its revival came a new type of ecumenical alliance between the Muslim the Christian world especially of Harun al-Rashid of the Muslim world and and uh, Charlemagne actually I got a book here I just pulled it out it's oh. a good book is uh Muhammad Charlemagne and the origins of Europe it's decent I've seen better oh. though. I've got actually a better one as a digital book that somebody else did. Okay. Um, by Pierre Baudry on uh, Charlemagne's ecumenical alliance. The, the key thing is that you had the Confucian Buddhist revival around economic and, and cultural trade and understanding with your neighbors. It was moving through not just, again, like I said, the South, but in the North, you had the Jewish kingdom of Khazaria, which was another conduit. Now, in my analysis, my research and the research of Pierre Baudry and a few others that I cite a lot, um, I get a very different reading than those who try to paint it as if it was like the Lord of the Rings Morlock zone of the orcs that are just like evil because they just like, you know, Jewish evil people just love selling slaves and being evil. Um, <laughs> it's like... That's not how evil works. Like, that's not what a motive for evil is ever. Uh, it's not ethnic based. So <laughs> what, absolutely, I agree. Yeah, I, what, yeah. What, what I what I did notice, though, is that at the same time as as King Bulan of, of Khazaria converts, you have at the same time for several generations, what is recognized as a Muslim renaissance of the Abbasid dynasty of Harun al-Rashid as well and al-Mamun, his, his father and his sons. And uh, a, Charl a, a Carolingian uh, Renaissance period in the Christian Europe as well, which was Charlemagne arose uh, at a certain time through an Augustinian movement. His grandfather, Charles Mar Martel, was an Augustinian. There was a big movement from the Irish Augustinians who had kept sort of this very important and beautiful uh, expression of, of Platonic Christianity alive in Ireland when Rome had collapsed and gone into debauchery and Satanism. Rome just broke apart. And Christianity was turned basically into, it was infiltrated. A lot of different pagan sects were masquerading as Christian. It went into hell on the mainland, but on the, uh, the island of Ireland, it was kept alive with the oh, monasteries, that the orphans that were reviving the, 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 the pure um, teachings of Christ. And after a few generations, when things settled down, they focused on uh, the Frankish kingdom, which was where Charlemagne emerged out of. And that's where the Augustinians organized their beach, their, their battle plan to create uh, basically what St. Augustine called for is a city of God on earth. Um, really? Charlemagne sort of be, went the furthest to actualize that consolidating um, kind of like what China had been doing after the warring states, you know, it, China went into its own dark age of like, uh, kind of like what happened with the Western Roman Empire when the Han Dynasty collapsed. You'll see China broke up into like little warring, warring um, mercenary factions fighting over terrain. It was hell for 400 years. And it was the Tang Dynasty restored a Confucian um, organizing principle, which had a lot of parallels to the Christian teachings of oh, Ren, I, agopic love. Uh, the I idea read of, that. Yeah. yeah. Tian Ming, the, the idea of city of God, or the, the idea that, God, that God's law is the basis for man's law, existed in the Confucian teachings as Tian Min, 
Um, oh, really? That's fascinating. I, I I just read that briefly, but yeah, Confucianism was, was a very close to Christianity. Yeah, they had a lot of key points. And and I mean, at the same measure too, there's there's abuses and perversions of Confucianism too that just saw the 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 form but not the spirit of love, which became often tyrannical and regimented, just like we have for Plat- Platonism or different perversions of Christianity where you have a priesthood using the word but none of the spirit to maintain power. So perversions happen universally in the same type of way, but the good was there. And I, I think the fact that King Bulan's, that Kazaria's in role as on a variety of levels, the Jews at that time played a very important role in maintaining this positive spirit of cooperation and, and growth. And I go through the details. I don't, we don't have time today, but I go through the details within my book, my books, Oh, really? I'll have to, is, uh, and is it the ones you sent me previously? Because uh, I would definitely be interested in that. Yeah. Uh, the, oh, uh, no, this is the Clash of the Two Americas, Volume 3. I'll send you a PDF. Um, okay. If people want to Google it, if they're listening and you just want to Google something, Google my name, Matthew Arrett, next to uh, Kazaria and the Forgotten Christian Jewish Muslim Confucian Alliance. If you Google that, you'll find a, a, um, a lecture I did a couple of years ago going through this and a supplementary reading you'll find below my video with a bunch of articles and online books, which will take you through more research. Um, The thing was, when the Crusades were were created out of the ultramontanist papacy and Venice, which were the primary orchestrators of the Crusades, which is also where the Templar cult was also created. What time now? What what year are we in? Early 11th century. Okay, yeah, okay, great. The, the 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 idea was to create a clash of civilizations to undo the danger of uh, these different civilizational forces co- emerging and collaborating around a con a common idea of the divinity of mankind wow. in opposition to the oligarchy's desire to reestablish a, a global Roman Empire centered around you know synthetic cults depopulation other things. So the oligarchy wow. after Rome collapsed, migrated, they sort of splintered in their families, some centering around the Roman, what's called the, the Ultramontanist papacy. The Ultramontanists were a faction representing the older families who were of the view that the papacy should be both the spiritual and material controller, arb- arbiter of the world. Um, then you had also factions they were collaborating with in Venice. That was another center, center of command where they tried to reconstitute the empire in the lagoons of Venice, which became, after a few hundred years, it took them to do this, but that became the center of global evil for about 600 years. And do some you of the- think the Venetians actually came? This is another one of these many books I've been reading. They came originally from uh, like Iran and R- Iraq. Um, so um, that's maybe the word more anthropology. There might be some etymology behind the word Phoenician mm-hmm. and Ven- Venetian. I don't know. I didn't do the work. I'm not. Okay. I, so I'm not going to comment. Yeah, no but problem. I do know that that they were directly related to the Roman Imperium families. Mm-hmm. That right. I, I do know that. Um, and you might you might have something there with the Phoenician connection. I'm not too sure. Phen- the Phoenicians had both a good and a bad component as well. There there was like yeah. sort of a deep state of of, of the yeah. Phoenician. Yeah, and um, they created the Jesuits there, which were really a dark force. Uh, well, the Jesuits were forever. created out of, um, ironically, the Habsburg control over the papacy in around 1435 when the Habsburgs took control of Rome. And the Habsburg intelligentsia, they, I mean, you know, that was one of the leading families, but the whole oligarchical hive, whether they, 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 they manufactured a new synthetic cult with a cardboard cutout, sort of like a proto MK Ultra character. <laughs> Ignatius Loyola, who was just a, a Spanish mercenary who had a big revelation, but they used him. And, and one of the big stories that is told is that he was discovered when he was on a, trying to raise money for his pilgrimage to go to the Holy Land. And he was in Venice in St. Mark's Square and a leading noble of the, of the Venetian oligarchy had a dream of an angel saying, how are you here sleeping in your comfy bed when this holy man is outside your window? And he looks outside of his window and there he sees Ignatius Loyola in poverty, trying to raise money to go to the Holy Land. And he's like, come on in, my friend. And he, he houses him for weeks and then he takes him to the Doge of Venice who bankrolls his, his journey to the Holy Land. And so obviously it's a story that's been concocted. 
yeah um to justify an actual kind of like it, it it was kind of like a um a synthetic templar like masonic cult that was created a few hundred years after the templars were created but they're all just cults that's all they are yeah to do harm like, yeah to, 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 to weaponize factions of the oligarchy around a myth that they create using certain illusions of secret knowledge that you get through doing rituals. Mm-hmm. That, and, and in so doing, you strip your ego, you strip your identity and become more of an instrument for a will you yourself don't understand, though you think you do. Um, Albert Pike did this with his upgrade of Scottish Rite Freemasonry later on, that that idiot cross-dressers, cross-dressers like her, um, J. Edgar Hoover were a part of, right? He was His identity was that he was fulfilling a, a divine command according to these ancient rites that he had been put through. So yeah, but it's, it's like, an evil, it's a satanic yeah. command. So, it's not God's command. Yeah, no, perversion. Exactly. So to pull back now to the story of Kazaria, Venice was the, key, the first nation to make Jewish ghettos was Venice. The first nation to ban the rights of Jews to participate in commerce or really? to have any conventional job or be a, a member of a guild that would give you skills was Venice, followed really? soon thereafter by almost every country of Europe that had their their fifth colonists run by Venice that passed similar laws saying, no, Jews cannot do anything but but uh, money lending and selling in used cloth. And wow. so it, it pigeons the entire Jewish uh, community, which had formerly been like, I mean, very, very like Renaissance movements were like inspired by the Jewish Radonite traders that were negotiating the treaties be- between Charlemagne and Harun al-Rashid, who were operating the houses of wisdom um, yeah. that were teaching astronomy and poetry between Confucians, uh, Chinese, Christians, oh. and Muslims, and Jews, all alike learning that astronomy. That would have been a beautiful period yeah. to be alive, wouldn't have it? It was an amazing period of hope. And and so, and the trade routes, the Silk Road trade routes were the, the Jewish Radonite traders, who again were tied to Kazaria, were renowned for speaking like 14 languages wow. like it, it was a they played an important role in the um the, the 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 judicial system of charlemagne's kingdom in the south and the kingdom of narbonne which was a, a sub kingdom within charlemagne's kingdom where charlemagne married one of his daughters to the king a jewish king that was managing a muslim uh, majority territory in southern spain or no northern wow. spain um, to great effect. I mean, the, the look at the arts and the architecture and the 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 the, the, the schools that were built during this time. It's amazing. So that's that had to be stopped. Yeah. And so Venice played a big role in corralling the Jews, pigeonholing them into oh. like this very controlled uh, lifestyle um, into ghettos, uh, allocated yeah. zones, which were then replicated in other parts of Europe. But Venice was first, and um, they consciously found what was useful was court Jewish bankers, which was like, you know, yeah, the, it was more explicit in the Muslim and Christian world that you can't do usury in money lending. Um, but it doesn't explicitly state that in the Torah that you can't, although it okay. kind of does. But but anyway, we overlooked that. And, right. and so what they did is they basically said, okay, we every, every Christian uh, kingdom needs to have their court Jew as, oh, as yeah. a food in. Mm-hmm. And those it became like you saw it in the Confederate South in America is that the that the the house slave you know who in some ways were, were became more vicious to their own fellow slaves than even the white masters. So uh. the same sort of thing happened where the origins of things like the 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 Montefiore the Jewish Montefiore family which is still a very strong powerful family today or the Sassoon family who was assigned to do operational uh, controls of Asia manage the opium wars or the Rothschild family, which came later on. That was only in the 18th century, new blood. Um, these were, were sort of mercenary families selected by a sociopath who was given tasks that they did well. They carried them out with no due of conscience, often usually destroying many of their own fellow Jews that they didn't have a problem with because they're ultimately satanic. Like you said, it's not even Jewish. And they were beholden to commands. They followed orders very well. So they were given affluence, money, certain guarantees that your kids will have a little set of dynastic privileges as long as they, they keep to the family business, mm-hmm. which they, they have to do. And, uh, and the, the, but the family, these Jewish families are hate absorbers. They're scarecrows. They're designed to carry out the brutal, the brutal tactics that hurt nations and people in economic warfare. And the understanding is that they're going to be the ones who will then receive the hate 
of the abused who then see, oh, there's a Jewish conspiracy. It's a Jewish banking conspiracy. But where did that come from? And then, you know, new stories are, are added to it to say, well, they came from Kazaria. Oh, it's the Kazarians right. who were evil. Oh, and, yeah. and, and then the story is added to and added to. And I think, like I said, David Icke was the first to innovate it in, yeah. that, in that fashion with that twist. And David Icke is himself an MK Ultra uh, freak who was himself working for BBC, had a big revelation that he was like now the Messiah, the one selected to save humanity that he said on a, on a talk show live and then comes out basically taking conspiracy tropes that are already existing and then adding the, the shape-shifting lizard thing from another dimension. Out yeah, to that's, thing, yeah. Which is it's, designed, whether he believes it or not, he might be totally authentically genuine in his beliefs and convictions. Mm -hmm. But the point is, um, it undermines, it's designed to undermine the authenticity of every other true element of the conspiracy theory by then throwing, oh yeah, the queen is a hologram and a shape-shifting lizard you sucking know, her fear energy. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> exactly i've gone down like i've heard a lot of things and people who are like you know work for me it executive all of a sudden say these things and i'm like okay come on like yeah. i'm i'm really practicing it's like come on like you know let's if it were true like okay let's let's have the evidence just because david ike told you you know well then the evidence becomes all it. anecdotal right like yeah you can get somebody else who really like says that they saw like al gore's eyes like blinking that yeah. way or something i you know? see those like, pictures too yeah i mean i don't think you know i think the link towards uh the, of them with child trafficking is quite strong evidentially oh, yeah. which is horrifically bad which is pretty uh like you know cold-blooded which why i think you could call them lizard-like in their you know cold-blooded behavior uh, certainly disgusting but yeah actually being a lizard yeah you have to practice mental discipline don't you with everything yeah it's hard to make a human uh be, become dominated by their lizard brain you know like because we all have like sort of our in the evolutionary sort of things we got sort of and i like sean stone's out or description of this I, I think his theory is good that we all have sort of that that lizard component that mammals don't have or, or mm -hmm. uh, sorry mam mammals have something additional and humans have something even more yes but to make that part of the brain become the dominant thing um is really hard to do really unnatural but they do it they try hard well through fear because i've seen it with people mm -hmm. who i care about when they're activated intensely by fear they turn mm -hmm. off any like they turn off your humanity and your love and just like you know yeah. that's that behavior can can they i've seen it even within the last years with the covid mania Absolutely. But, and fear but, and ignorance da dance hand in hand. It's a dynamic, right? Where you have ignorance, you have a breeding ground for fear. Where you have fear, you have a breeding ground for ignorance. And in both cases, you don't have a breeding ground for love, like authentic love and creativity it doesn't exist in that environment. You know, yes. that's what free will has to choose to abide by something to break free of the fear and ignorance dynamic that we're locked into. And we have negative feedback loops that we like cycle through and tell ourselves bad stories because we're gripped by these two things on an individual level or is on a societal level and we have to yes. choose to say okay anybody you know you you're you're a consultant you're a teacher you you've obviously helped people through this type of trap we do with our own minds right mm -hmm. um and it's only when the person makes a decision to say i'm gonna stop this <laughs> yes and, and who knows what that moment that threshold is it's different for everybody but that has to happen where you're like i'm gonna stop this now <laughs> yes and then you've got hope then you've got to do a new terrain you've created for yourself to move in it, yeah, it's true. And I mean, I've heard the the term about keeping your frequency high so much, but it is actually very true because the most powerful thing we have is our spirit. Um, and, and then, you know, we can overcome so much physically we're learning now. We're very, very strong. But one of the questions, and I, I wanted to, we're, I know we're going to wrap up quick a little bit sooner because uh, there's uh, I'm heading off to a, an event tonight I have to say for uh, Maxine Bernier's coming to uh, Durham so we'll be speaking there but I'm happy to tell the audience that uh, Matthew's agreed to speak um, on, on on the next couple of months on a longer dive because it takes a couple hours with you even to like scratch the surface when you're learning and, and I appreciate your patience but I wanted because you know a lot about uh, China as well and I've seen you write about China and Russia quite a bit and, and this sort of the road there, you know, the bricks and what's the road called now, the road they're building, kind of like the Silk Road. Yeah, um, road initially. 
Yeah, the Bell Road is very exciting. And then how we could uh, we could attach C Canadian with, at the Bering Strait. I mean, the future could be a lot like it was back. I was just getting that sense in the 11th century with all of these groups, you know, independent of religion, like, you know, working in harmony together, we could be entering into that phase. Yeah. Do you think the Chinese influence on the world now, just to people ask this, I mean, and we can tackle the his historical aspects next time, is a lie as well? Like, um, are the Chinese people yeah. um, better off than we're led to believe and oh yeah yeah I much mean, less like the the you were here about the the uyghurs isn't it and and the yeah. it's the chinese communist party is xi jinping fighting against them or what's going on there is i know that's sort of current history I mean, look the, the the chinese communist party is a bit of a wild i mean it's 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 a bit more a bit different now but it, it's still generally a bit of a wild wild west thing like it's it's power blocks it's there's no one thing called the chinese communist party i mean as much as we a lot of westerners have been given these simplified narratives by the cia and their different you know, offshoots that mm -hmm. in, in the, both mainstream and even alt media that try to like just portray this thing as like one thing and it's like it's not one thing it, it, there's there's Is factions there's fights there's yeah, is it their deep state really? The Chinese deep state and is uh, well, Xi Jinping state, get fighting against it for Xi freedom? Jing, Xi Jinping is fighting against uh, fifth columnists and deep state operatives, some of whom are embedded within the Chinese Communist Party, of which there is like almost 100 million people who are members, right? That's a very, yeah, that's, that's like, big. That's three candidates. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's like, what I heard. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, so and some some of the deep state operatives are outside of the party. You know, it's 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 a bit of everything. But there has been um, the reason why the oligarchy has was defeated in their attempt at creating a one world government, depopulation, transhuman, post nation state order in two thousand and nine, when they announced that they wanted to do it at COP fourteen, which was supposed to have come out of that. You know, two thousand and nine was a moment where the the system almost had the plug pulled it could have it could have blown at that moment i when heard the, that yeah humanity could be done or we could have been depopulated yeah, so there like was a, a serious billion of, uh, if, if trump didn't get in as well he played a big well, role. That, that came later but but 2008 yeah. 2009 that was the whole financial system blowing out by the housing bubble which was just what what opened the gates to every other bubble of derivatives that had been built up out of thin air that were all like hyperinflationary nothing now there was a serious uh, consideration on whether the system should be pulled at that time or not, but it required everybody being on the same page according to the New World Order script, as had been discussed in the 1980s and 90s uh, by certain factions dominant within Russia, within China, that were all supposed to be on the David Rockefeller page. Now, the thing is that by that time, and again, read for people listening and they're confused, read volume two and volume three okay. of my Clash of the Two of Americas. I where will. I go into a lot more detail than I could possibly do at this one moment here. Is are they on Amazon or um on your yeah, website? Get them on Amazon or through my okay. website, CanadianPatriot.org, but it still takes you to Amazon. I, I gotta hold your nose and just buy it there. <laughs> um, I love that. Yeah, I do that sometimes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, all that to say, the um Russia, uh, China and India specifically at 2009 COP 14 locked themselves in a room. They didn't participate in any of the uh, the conference proceedings that were supposed to create global government uh, instruments to enforce carbon reduction uh, treaties onto the world. Mm -hmm. They basically sabotaged the whole thing. They, they broke the New World Order agenda in 2009. And since then, I mean, Russia has, has gotten the strength to get off its two feet and start like standing on its own. And it finally began intervening in 2015 in blocking U.S. regime change operations, which were supposed to turn Syria into a new Libya. They were supposed to do the same thing in Venezuela and Kazakhstan, a variety of Kazakhstan being a key zone in the, the Silk Road east and west. That, that went through a, regime, a Soros regime change operation attempts. Um, Isn't that where they wanted to have the New World Order with Estonia as well um, in Pakistan? No, the New World Order is not going to be. No, the, you've got you've got some weird occult shit in Kazakh, uh, Kazakhstan. Yes, you do have that. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> but uh, that's not the center of the New World Order. No, that that is that is a zone. Um, they wanted it to be, I heard. It's a sacrificial zone. They have their local. Um, they, they create. The oligarchy creates um, synthetic cults operating on Masonic rites of initiation as a template in every part of the world. They did it in India around mm -hmm. the creation or the inflammation of the Brahmin caste 
that would become the initiates and controllers on behalf of their British overlords for 200 years. That's what they did in India. It was through, and they used certain Indian ancient uh, stories and religious things from the Upanishads and, uh, and Vedic stories that were twisted to justify an oligarchical master-slave arrangement of society. With the caste. With its own variants of, of sat Satanism, child worship, uh, child sacrifice, other things. Um, Indiana Jones, actually, in the Temple of Doom, makes fun of uh, some of that story is true. That's actually some of the, 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 the sects that you were introduced to in that story are actually true. Uh, that's the, and, and that's the way they kind of work with Hollywood is they banalize actual inner beliefs of the oligarchy and they banalize them so that the, the zeitgeist, the people don't know how to differentiate between what is real, what is false when it comes, it's all becomes fiction, right? Mm, yeah, uh, that's, yeah. They that's, do that with uh, Solomon's Temple too, Indiana Jones and uh, uh, um, the Last Crusade. They actually believe like big chunks of the oligarchy in the Templar cult believe that stuff, but they mm -hmm. then they banalize it, make it fiction. And then so part of this thing. Now it doesn't mean it's not fiction. It's still fiction, but it's a hot, but it's actually a type <laughs> of fiction that that is shaped perversely history in an important way. Like all of the crusades that happened for 400 years were shaped by that belief. They couldn't have happened if you didn't have the crusader mythos around oh, Templars. Geez. The lies upon lies upon lies. Yeah, but when you when you start appreciating how it works, you kind of smell it more and more easily in a variety yeah. of because it's ultimately not that creative. They just do the same thing. So all that to say the um the oligarchy in Kazakhstan in this case, same thing. There's there's an oligarchical occult system of of priesthoods with their own symbolic uh, worshiping of numerology and other things. And then you have legitimate patriots and nationalists who fight against that. Mm -hmm. So you have two things. Um, in well, every yeah, throughout throughout time, it seems until we can get get a get to the yeah. next evolution of humanity. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so, in my in my analysis, China has saved the world several times over, as has Russia. The, that's the reason yeah. why the oligarchy has not won yet. Because, like, why are we having this fight? Is it because the there's too many nationalists and patriots in North America and, and in uh, Europe who have power who are doing battle? No. No, not at all. No, they, they've pretty much consolidated most of their power on the political spectrum. Not to yeah. say the people, but the political class is whorish by yeah. and large with maybe a few exceptions like Maloney. Um, Georgia Maloney is, is interesting in, in Italy, but I mean, these are exceptions. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, the that is, that's not that the is reason why the oligarchy has not been successful yet. It's They haven't been successful yet because of Russia, China, increasingly India, increasingly Iran increasingly other Gulf states even who are realizing that they're all going to be sacrificed on an altar of Gaia post, you know, in the, in the post-carbon age where we're not allowed to burn oil, their entire economies have been premised on oil. And now yes. they recognize that they're all just as disposable as Saddam, Saddam Hussein. The big so climate fraud and the, uh, for Agenda 2030 just set us up, you'll own nothing yeah. and be so that's happy. Why all, and that's why all these slaves. They that's really just want us to be slaves. Yeah, what? and that's why all of these UAE, Gulf states, other things, Saudi Arabia even, who played very negative roles as geopolitical tools of an empire of the West for many de decades, that's why they're now breaking from their their um, profiles. Yeah. Say, well, if we're going to survive, it's going to be because we, go, we, we, we reorganize and leap east to the only boat that floats. Same thing for Turkey is currently yes. having an identity crisis. They're, are they're, they leaving they're, NATO? They're leaving NATO. Potentially. I think BRICS. Yeah, potentially. Yeah, it's yeah they might be. They, they already applied to join the BRICS, um, a lot of African countries. So, I mean, th that's Africa. where the actual water is that's going to put up the fire in the house. And, and, and Absolutely. And yeah. A lot of Westerners have been psychologically castrated to think that the water is their enemy. And they, uh, yeah. they look at Russia or they look at China and they just see evil. And they yeah. don't see anything that Russia and China are actually doing to do battle with this oligarchy. I, I do. Yeah. I know you do, but, <laughs> but it's, it's tough. It, 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 this mental block is very strong. Um, so yeah. level of indoctrination, optimistic about Canada in the next 10 years. Do you think 10 years? Uh, yes. I'll say good. yes for 10 years. 
Don't ask Yay. me about five. <laughs> yeah, five is uh, maybe, maybe. maybe. I hope so. But, I think uh, my I humor. Know. Well, look at what I'm learning. I mean, this is yeah. a, it's like I'm in university through all these wonderful people I'm interviewing. So thank you so much. I'm going to uh, book you in for January. I've got a lot of questions um, on all these topics, but hopefully everyone will read all your books before our next one. What do you suggest we learn about next time, Matthew, in, uh, in January, February? What's important for uh, this struggle that we're in right now? Well, I'm going to send you a, a, a PDF of volume two in Defense of Manifest Destiny for the Untold History of Canada. And maybe we could find some content in there to flesh out. But the world is changing fast. So depending on what, what the world looks like come January, we might want to do something totally different. Maybe. Cur I don't know. Current events. Maybe current right. events. Yeah. Break something down. Okay. All right. Well, thanks so much. You have a wonderful weekend. All right. Take you care. too, Tish. Bye. Bye. Bye.